Good afternoon, traders. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I know uh, that a lot of you are still coming in here. I see the numbers kind of going by. Uh, thanks for joining us live here this afternoon on this webcast with uh, Jared Tendler. Uh, we'll go over who Jared is and some detail. And uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Um, the first thing we want to get into here, uh, Jared, thanks for coming on. We appreciate having you on. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. So here's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to just uh, give you some context as to why we'd want to listen to what Jared has to say. Uh, we'll go over Jared's background and experiences and performance coaching. Uh, Jared's also done some podcast chat with traders and has appeared in, uh, at other venues. I really would encourage you to listen to those. Uh, we'll go over perspectives on solving mental game issues. This is a big problem from my experience with my own pop, prop traders, as well as the folks at Convergent Trading. Um, we're going to talk about a practical approach to mapping out our uh, our emotions, and then we'll uh, take a quick uh, pivot and and speak uh, briefly about Jared's new ebook, which you can obtain for free here, uh, as well as on his website. And then we'll jump into some audience Q and A. We have some questions that were pre-submitted, uh, but we also, if we have time, time permitting, we'll cover some questions that you can type into your chat box in front of you, or uh, if you're on YouTube live streaming, you can go into the live chat and type your question in there, and we'll do our best to capture it and have Jared uh, answer it for you. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about the details of the book giveaway. Jared has been very generous. He offered up three of his, uh, three copies of his book, The Mental Game of Trading, and uh, we're going to randomly select three traders from the attendees on GoToWebinar, those who have registered, and uh, we'll uh, we'll go over the details of that. So first things first, Jared, um, let's talk about who you are. Uh, <laughs> what we what we know about you, our our intelligence service, <laughs> link LinkedIn. Um, says that you're a former professional golfer and uh, you 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 studied at Sk Skidmore College and you went and got a BA in business and psychology. Then in 2003, you got an MS in counseling psychology, and then you spent 2005 up to this uh, present moment as a mental game coach, generally for performance uh, type venues. You wrote three books. Uh, two about poker, the mental game of poker, and the mental game of poker two. And then you also t uh, wrote this book that has captured our interest and was brought to us to, a t to our attention by several convergent trading members, um, including a head trader called the Mental Game of Trading. Uh, you also recently released an intuition, uh, uh, the, the Intuition ebook. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, first things first. Do you trade or do you coach or both? Uh, I'm a coach. So I have basically learned uh, the competitive landscape of trading, much like I learned the competitive landscape of high level poker and in esports. So three industries that I'm not a kind of avid competitor in, although, you know, I played poker as a kid, still play with friends, played video games as a kid and, you know, been involved in the stock market since I was 13, you know, but more as an investor, you know, do a little bit of crypto trading, but I'm not going to ever pretend that I have, uh, you know, the, the chops to hang with you guys. So, no, I mean, I, my, and, and I've, asked, I've been asked this question for years of like, why don't I play poker? Or why don't I trade? And for me, it's like uh, my competitiveness is kind of driven to be the best coach I can be. And I just don't have as much time to, I mean, I, I, I respect how good you all are. So I wouldn't pretend that I could get good at, you know, it, you know, it, it kind of as a part time side job. So, no, I think for me, you know, I've studied the competitive landscapes. I've studied, you know, for the last eight years, I've worked with with poker player uh, with with traders, um, you know, both institutionally, retail 
uh, across different, uh, you know, kind of markets. And, you know, there are nuances that are different, but at the end of the day, we're all people first. So the core of my system applies across industries. And then we just deploy it, you know, to the, the, the unique nuances of what is demanded as a trader. Okay. So the, it's, I guess it's very important to frame the fact that you're a professional golfer, which I've used golf. I mean, I use analogies a lot. Those of you who've been following, who've been following for the last 12 years know that I can come up with some pretty, uh, pretty crazy analogies. But golf has been one that, uh, that I've used a lot. So can you just touch maybe for a minute or two about your experience as a professional golfer because that has a lot of similarities to trading where you know it's you can't lean on a teammate you know you're it you're out there and the score and your scorecard is going to to be very specific to how well you did at that moment and being a professional that must have put you in a position of of a lot of pressure what was that like well, I, to be honest, my professional uh, chops were not that long, right? But I was, I played, you know, golf at a high level for a very long time. Most of my accomplishments come as, you know, a collegiate golfer where I was a three-time All-American, won nine tournaments in college, and really, you know, was choking under the pressure of, you know, trying to qualify for the U.S. Open in 1997 that, that occurred. I missed by a shot to get onto the second stage of, of, of qualifying, which effectively is a small PGA Tour event based on the quality of the field. Uh, but I missed, you know, four putts inside three feet. And that was the first time that the pressure really kind of consumed me. And that that problem kind of kept happening in the the bright lights of elite national events. And so actually in 2011, when I um, you know graduated, I went to get a master's degree and subsequently licensed as a therapist. And it wasn't until 2007 when I started playing professional golf um, and having kind of solved my own issues um, and gotten my game up to a place where I could uh, where I could compete. Ironically, um, that was when I first got into poker and I made a choice um, to kind of continue to dive into this new industry for me of, of poker where it was kind of wide open runway um, and and not pursue professional golf to kind of its fullest. I had planned to go to Q school, but my, my golf, uh, my, my poker career just kind of blew up. Um, it, ironically, that was like the safe road, <laughs> but trying to, trying to become a professional golfer was the riskiest proposition. It was going to cost me, you know, multiple six figures to try to do, um, and so, but to answer your question though, you know, the, 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 the bright lights of competitive golf, you know, demand high level precision and it demands a high level of preparation. I think, you know, traders by and large, there's a lot of preparation, but, but you're, you're playing you know, like a, effectively like a PGA tour event every single day. So you don't have as much time to prepare like golfers do. So for them and for me, you know, a lot of that is where, you know, you make your money, you know, in a sense. And, and you don't want to be, you know, um, uh, unprepared like that. That's actually the biggest reason why, you know, performance fails. And, and that was one of the reasons that I was choking early on was that I was just not sufficiently prepared. Uh, one of the things we may get to today and one of the things I sort of espouse in the, in the trading book is that, uh, you know, as traders, if you're dealing with fear, you need to first understand that your system is strong enough, kind of internalized. Right. Because a lot of times you think, you know, that you're good enough. But when when there's hesitation and there's fear kind of preventing you from getting into positions or staying in them, a lot of times it actually has to do with a weakness in your process, a weakness in your preparation, uh, a weakness in the, the, the conviction that you have with the strategy that you're kind of bringing into battle in a sense. And so that fear is actually quite justified. And for me, you know, the fear was quite justified because I actually was a pretty terrible putter back back in the day. <laughs> there aren't more overused parallels to trading than golfing and poker <laughs> except every once in a while and this is for everybody except every once in a while i might use a race car driving which is a passion that i had uh when i was in college uh as as an example but you've hit on both uh, professions and and really uh high performance uh endeavors that uh, that are quite parallel Let's move on to the perspectives on solving mental game issues. What are you, your views on the role of emotions and their place in trading? It's I, I take a very kind of hard stance on this. I think if you deal with the reality that emotions have 
um, you know, a, 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 they can be an asset for you if they're kind of clear, right? If you're unbiased, if you're not imprinting your own needs into the market and are much more able to absorb what's happening, then emotions provide a role to sense opportunity, right? Intuition oftentimes comes as a form of emotion, whether it's sort of some subtle fear or hesitation, because there actually is, you know, some, uh, some trend against you in the market or some excitement because you're actually seeing some opportunity, right? If your emotions are clear, those, those, that sensation, that intuition is going to be more, more likely to be right. However, for most traders, what, what, what we look at their mistakes, you know, the, the hesitation, uh, the jumping into positions that they ought not to be, the inability to sit on their hands, which seems like impatience, but is actually really, you know, FOMO or, or revenge trading kind of getting in the way, uh, that, that those emotions are driven by biases and flaws that are unknown and uncontrolled. And so we can take a more pragmatic approach to emotions and not say that this is stuff that we need to suppress and get rid of and discard, but instead understand that they have a role in affecting our best performance and a role in affecting our worst. And if you can identify the signals of either, because it becomes a lot easier for you to be at your best and a lot easier for you to avoid your worst. But we can't just disregard all this stuff. We have to go through this process, which we're going to talk more about, which I call mapping, right? Where you can actually start to create, in essence, almost like a price chart of your emotions, right? And you can see the subtle, you know, kind of up and down ticks of them. And very often traders make their biggest mistakes when they're already emotionally compromised. They don't recognize that they are. And that's the biggest problem, right? You can't stop what you can't see. And when the emotional system is overactive, it has the power to shut down higher brain function. And so what you'll oftentimes get is a, is a trader in a spot where, you know, they know exactly what they ought not to do. And yet they're, and they're thinking, you know, don't get in, don't get in, don't get in. And what happens? Somehow their hand is on their mouse and they're entering a position that, that they know they shouldn't. That is happening because the emotions are overactive and have shut down and compromised that part of the brain. So if you don't see that that's occurred, your ability to stop it is zero. If you see it earlier, your ability to stop it is better. But if you see it when it's just begun, you, you are empowered to fight against a functional reality of the brain in a way that actually provides you the advantage. Because when the emotional system's overactive, it is the one that is in control. And until you do some something drastic, uh, your, your chances of, of actually stopping those common mistakes uh, is pretty much zero. Yeah, it's 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 uh, that's been my experience uh, myself and with every trader that I've backed is that uh, you know I read I read a long time ago. I don't know where I read it, but I know it was a one of my favorite books. It's weird I don't remember what which one it was, but it said uh, the the logical part of your brain is the little rider on the back of the elephant called emotions. When that elephant starts stampeding, you pulling on the reins isn't going to have any effect at all. That's and I, I I feel that. I, I felt that. And, and so, yeah, knowing and interrupting that beginning process or having some way to step ahead of that beginning process is definitely key for traders. So yeah. how do you use... And sorry, just, just interject here too. We, we, we can look at this actually neurologically. There's a, the, the part of the brain is called the prefrontal cortex and its job is for emotional control. Like if you do a brain scan, you know, cut somebody off the top of their head and look, look at the, the neural activity, you'll see that part of the brain is red hot when they're trying to suppress and control their emotions. But that part of the brain is dead when the emotions are too hot. So it's it's sort of that you're, you're we have to understand the architecture of the brain. The part of the brain responsible for emotional control is shut down by your emotions. Functional reality. So again, I'm just kind of putting one more, you know, kind of piece of this so that those of you out there listening understand you cannot change the fundamental architecture of the of the brain. The system that I that we're talking about here today is designed to help you work within those constraints. And, you know, I, I know that the, tr the trading systems that you espouse do the exact same thing, right? If you're going to operate outside the parameters, you better damn well know what you're doing. For the most part, you need to operate within the parameters because they're there for a reason. So, you know, this mapping process that we're going to discuss 
is there for a reason. It's and the reason is to give you a, ch a fighting chance, you know, to to actually stop the stuff from affecting you. Would you consider this an accurate uh, accurate kind of parallel to what you're saying? By mapping your emotions, you're essentially creating a stop loss point, a reasonable stop loss point for your emotions kind of overcoming uh, the, the prefrontal cortex and shutting it down and you're going on tilt. By mapping it, you're kind of creating this, uh, hopefully this kind of place where you just say, okay, stop, hands off, and you're done. Would that be accurate? It's giving you a chance for that to occur, right? Right okay. now, if you don't do the mapping, your chance of it is is almost zero. Let's let's use a car analogy. The way that I would say this is, um, you know, you're driving down a road, fog rolls in, or you're not really paying attention, and you, all of a sudden you sort of veer off of your intended destination, right? And so the mapping is kind of erecting road signs that say like, you know, hey dumbass, you you've taken the wrong turn. Let's let's kind of get back and and navigate our way back to the right path here, you know, if, if that, if those, those signals are not there, like internally, then you're just going to keep on driving. And or in this case, right, you're just going to not see uh, the opportunity to do something different. And, and for me, I think it's more like kind of price action, right? The stop loss comes after you've done a lot of work to recognize your emotions at certain spots. And, and there's actually like a clear ability, a clear skill to do that. Right now, you're just sort of mapping the price movement of your emotions so you can kind of see what's happening. Right. Okay. So that pretty much answers the why bother question, right? That we have in front of us here. And how tough is this? You know, is this uh, something I kind of do on my own? Do I need to hire Jared for this? Uh, and if I had to do it on my own, how long might it reasonably take me you know, how much data do I need? How many samples do I need of mapping these emotions to get something that's that I can build a plan around? It's it's definitely doable. I think the the biggest hurdle is the false perception that it's really hard. You know, I think a lot of us just don't take the time to look and study. And so if you took the same amount of time, maybe frankly, frankly, even like 10 percent of the time you took to develop your competency as a trader and devote it towards paying attention to, you know, the details you know, that, that are required for your map. I know I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, the thoughts and the emotions, uh, the triggers, the situations where this is occurring, you know, the actions that you would, you'd take around that time, uh, maybe physical sensations, the changes in your perception of, of the market, you know, changes in your decision-making process, right? All of those things become the, the nuances and the details that we're trying to map and identify. If you start like actually writing those down today, now, right? And, and, and did that kind of day over day uh, while you're trading, you know, you can have kind of a, a journal piece of paper open, you just, you know, as, as things emerge, uh, you know, just take, take some notes down. You could set an alarm for every hour to go off and just write down what's going on in your head. You're going to start to see some patterns. And, and that's really what we're after here, right? We're not looking for these one-off instances where, you know, a problem arises. It's like, no, no, here are my big problems, right? The trading mistakes that I make. What are the emotional, mental circumstances, physical circumstances, changes in perception that's occurring around that? And, and if you do it day over day and kind of iterate on it, you will see a difference. I, I mean, it's it's I, I have yet to work with somebody. I've yet to come across somebody that's actually done the work that's not been able to get better at it. Now, the, the, the second question is like, how do you know when you actually need a lot of help? Well, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I know that my time is limited. And so the book is incredibly detailed providing a lot of the most common thoughts that traders have, the physical symptoms, the sensations that occur around, you know, you know, the big problems that we talk about, greed, fear, anger, confidence issues, so lacking confidence, overconfidence, and discipline problems. But within those, right, there's a lot of subsets. So there's, you know, the fear of losing, there's the fear of mistakes, there's the hatred of mistakes, there's revenge trading, you know, there's, a, a, a you know, a perfectionism and, uh, you know, other, other discipline problems. So, all of those have been very well mapped in the book. So if you're struggling to do this on your own, right, take what you found, go into the book and, you know, see what matches up, see what lines up. Then, you know, if you've been struggling with the book for about a month and you're really not making any progress, well, there's a, a troubleshooting chapter at the end. And, and I'd say the biggest one, the biggest mistake that I typically see 
that traders have difficulty taking this step is that they have become so good at suppressing their emotions that, that they're actually not able to do this mapping process. So if that's you, one of the things you're gonna look out for early on is the signals of suppression, the signals that you're actually kind of squelching your emotions. And so what you might notice is like a, you, your mind kind of em enters this like hyper logical state where you have these sort of repetitive excuses and things you might say to yourself uh, that become the rationale that's, that's helping you to kind of keep the emotion at bay. And look, I mean, in the short term, you know, that, that is a good thing, right? It's, it's a good thing that you've developed that competency. What you're not realizing though, is that the, the, the suppression of your emotions is actually decreasing your potential as a trader, right? Because now you're fighting yourself at the same time that you're fighting the market. Like we only have so much, you know, energy and bandwidth to be able to operate. So if 20% of our, our, of our psyche, of our, our mental resources are devoted towards monitoring and actually managing or controlling our emotions, I mean, you're basically kind of fighting with, you know, 20% of your capacity taken away from you and that there's no way that you can have the kind of consistent sensation of the market, the intuition that you want to have, the, the ability to adapt and, and evolve as a trader. So again, suppression is kind of the one thing that typically will get in the way. So, but again, if you've done kind of all that for about a month and you've seen no progress, right, then, then I'd say, you know, professional help is probably, you know, right for you. Which brings me to a poll that I wanted to launch at everyone. Unfortunately, those of you who are on Twitter are not going to be able to participate. But I want to ask this question here uh, that you're going to see in front of you. Uh, so the, the question is, and then let me grab this. The question is, <laughs> sorry. Have you ever sought mental health or performance assistance in the form of counseling, therapy, or life coaching? Uh, please go ahead and click on the all of the options that apply. This is anonymous. Uh, we don't know what you selected, but you can respond, and it's it'll help color what the audience is. We were where the audience is. We will uh, share this. With you, only about 30% of you have responded 50 seconds in. Well, I'm going to give this about 30 more seconds. So please take the moment to just click on the ones that work for you. It doesn't matter what the issue is, but the question is have you received help, counseling, therapy, life coaching? Uh, basically, coaching on your mental health is what it is. Uh, I see therapists as mental health coaches. My wife is a licensed therapist, so I get to hear about it a lot. <clears throat> okay, so we're at 70, 68%, uh, 70%. We're going to shut this down in five seconds. Uh, so go ahead and select your answer as best as you can, and we're going to shut this off. Very cool. So we spent a minute and a half on that. We're going to shut this down, and we're going to share this with you guys. Here it goes. The majority has not done any of it. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised. I don't know what you think, Jared, here by uh, these answers, but I'm, uh, actually, I'm actually surprised by I'm the number of people. Truthfully, I'm surprised it's actually that high. Um, I'm sorry, sorry that, that none of the above is that low. Um, I would have I would have predicted it would have been higher. So yeah, I'd say uh, at 50%, we're dealing with. Um, you know, pretty high high frequency of people that are sort of serious about this, and maybe that's somewhat of a self-selected sample. The fact that they're even here uh, suggests, <laughs> um, you know, they kind of intuitively know that, or or very obviously know that they, they need some work here, uh, and willing to kind of put their uh, their money where their mouth is. Yeah, so they're already doing some of this work, is what this means, right? Yeah. Uh, so 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 again, back to the question, uh, and I think you answered that already when can we resolve our issues alone versus seeking professional or outside help you know when when does one really kind of move from being able to do this themselves to um having to go out and get help yeah i guess i'd say one one other way of saying it would be like if you're stuck right it, to me the feeling of being stuck means that there's just no progression Right. Resolution 
you know, as a thing means that the problem has been permanently solved. And so you might ex still experience some fear in the markets, but uh, it's either, again, kind of a pure reflection of, of, of what's, what's happening, or at least how your, your, your system or strategy is interacting with the market, or that the fear has actually changed, right? So you, you maybe have had like a fear of losing, uh, but now that's kind of off the table and now it's a fear of mistakes. Or, you know, a common one is um, once fear has kind of been taken care of, now, you know, overconfidence can sometimes become a problem. Uh, so, you know, there's a constant evolution here. I think as long as you're progressing and progressing with the mapping means you're identifying new details, you can see that there's, you know, uh, new things that are kind of on the horizon. Uh, that's kind of part one. Part two is now, now I've got to kind of take this information and dig deep into those problems and identify the actual cause of them, which is, again, what the book is designed to help you to do. Um, and so if you do that, you're feeling like, yeah, I'm kind of still confused, but at least I'm learning more things. I can, I can, things are making sense, even though I'm not able to execute quite as well as I want to yet. But, you know, again, there's like a progression. I think when, when things really stop, right, when you feel like you're working at it and the work is not yielding any progress for two, three, four weeks at a time, that's when you can kind of start to see like, all right, I, I need some perspective. So maybe the first step is to, you know, find a colleague, uh, maybe somebody here at Convergent Trading who can kind of help to give you a different perspective, help you to think a bit differently. Maybe you look at a different section of my book. Frankly, I, look at my, I don't have all the answers. Maybe, maybe then it's time to actually look at some other, you know, trading psychology material. Maybe that helps to kind of give you a different perspective on this. Maybe it's something outside of trading psychology and maybe it's something, you know, in the larger sphere. Uh, but I, I think if, if you if you're making progress, you're on the right road um, and it's kind of up to your discretion whether you want to, you know, wrap it up with with professional help. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've spent the better part of the last 30 years telling people to suppress their emotions while trading <clears throat> versus which is how I learned it versus just what I used to say is, you know, there's this monkey, there's this chimp in your mind, in, in your head. Right. This this. Uh, this primal uh, character there that wants to fight or run. And, and, and just while you trade, the idea is not to put it in a cage, but to sit it next to you and to just kind of pay attention when it's screaming and just acknowledge that it's there, but you don't have to act on the fact that it's screaming. And just, it takes a lot, it took a lot of practice to be able to just have that monkey screaming and just, still be able to focus on the market and be aware that uh, it's it's noise. I don't have to respond to that noise. And that's what this mapping process seeks to to achieve ultimately. So uh, what can you give us can you give us an idea of what this mapping uh, our emotions process looks like? Uh, how do we do this? Yeah, I mean, if, if you've got the examples, I think I've kind of done an intro uh, enough already. I think, again, the key is that, uh, you know, these things occur in predictable patterns. So, you know, the first step is really to, to just identify in more of a brainstorm kind of way, you know, what are the thoughts, the emotions, the triggers, the, the, the uh, changes in your decision making, et cetera, that I mentioned, and just get that all on paper. And then you want to create this sort of scale, right? on a scale of one to 10, 10 being fear at its biggest for you, one being the smallest sign that you can recognize, try to take what you found and, and kind of line it up. And, and what you see here is a fairly, you know, kind of basic beginning, right? And this is a common, you know, uh, degree of it, right? You can see some holes early on, very clear what's happening when it gets really bad, right? But there's not a lot of detail and there's, and we're, we're also attempting to kind of do this from a, a fear-based standpoint, um, and a technical standpoint, um, the technical I'm not really going to get into, but the more, uh, you know, you're identifying again, kind of the changes in your decision making, your perception, how your process of making a decision changes, right? That's, that is your technique, right? My golf swing goes from here to here, right? Small change. Why does that occur? Or sorry, when does that occur? Well, it occurs when I'm feeling a lot of pressure, right? And I want to feel like I could, I'm controlling it with my hands, right? What, what's the trading equivalent of that in terms of your decision making? Are you forcing positions because uh you know of of some it, uh, misperception in price action for example i mean you can be a lot more nuanced in, in that but so this is the basic one now if we go to the the the, the second one 
right? This is actually a, a, a kind of a, um, a real example of somebody who, you know, what you saw was their first draft. This was their second draft they came back with two weeks later, right? So when I said before, you know, it, it just takes a lot of iteration, a lot of paying attention. There's nothing unique about this particular trader. Right? He's not special. He just did the work. So what do you see now? Well, we see a lot more nuance at the front end, right? And so, you know, the, the stuff that's bolded to me was like the, the big markers for him, right? That at the earliest sign, there was this question, did I do the right thing? Is this going to be a loser? He does not have that question pop into his mind when he's in a good state of mind. But when fear has just begun to kind of get created, that's what's going to come to mind. And as it gets a little bit higher, right, we get to step two here, right? Fear pushes me to look at why I lost money on previous trades. Right now, there's like these lingering thoughts. He's trying to move on and be more kind of focused on what, what's happening in the market right now. But the mind, the fear is starting to kind of pull him back, right? So why does this matter? As I said before, this gives you the ability to act, punch the monkey in the face, <laughs> right? And try to get him to calm down and ultimately... If you've done your job well in identifying the roots of your problems, you actually have a correction that's actually gonna, gonna kill the monkey. We, that, that's what we're after, right? We're not gonna kill your emotions as, as you know in their entirety, but you can correct your fear, your anger, your greed, you name it, for these particular reasons, right? And so uh, the mapping is just like kind of the beginning process of this. And then of course, right, you know, get to like step four, five, or six here, you know, now, now there's got to be aggressive action uh, that's taken. Otherwise, you know, the antidote that we found was you just actually have to stop, right? And and those are your indicators that uh, that you have to stop. For some traders, actually, you know, there's a a, a, a confidence issue I call desperation. Uh, I'm sure there's nobody on the line that uh, knows the feeling of desperation, so probably doesn't apply to you. Obviously, you can sense my sarcasm. But for him, what we found was that um, he couldn't get to step three. If he was at step three, even though theoretically there was still control, the risk was too great because if something went wrong, not just even like an active position moving against him, you know, uh, one third of his way towards his target, that was enough to go from from three to seven, and he was gone, and his account was gone also. So, so we found that you know two was the shutoff point. So, you know, you kind of have to be honest with yourself about the severity of your emotions and how quickly it can escalate. Because even if you have a map like this and you say, all right, well, fear uh, five is the level where I should stop. For some of you, it may be actually quite, quite a lot earlier. Okay, so with this, I mean, there's, how, how, how detailed does one need to get to see a return? You know, do, is it, you have to, you know, I can imagine that, uh, you know, I've met uh, just hundreds of traders and, and some of them will send an email that's like, it's, it's a book mm -hmm. and some will just really just skim the surface. You know, how does one know that they've, they've explored enough or have, have dug deep enough? Do you measure that by the fact that there isn't a change in the behavior and therefore they need to go deeper or how, how do you know? as a trader yeah, who's that, doing this. That you, you nailed it. I mean, there is such variability here, right? For some traders, that first, uh, you know, map or profile is enough, right? Sometimes, right, you fail because you're trying to monitor your emotional reactions in real time at the same time that you're trading. And it's hard to do those two things at once. If you actually can look at it, right, it's actually on your desktop in another spot on your, you know, on your setup, you look at it you're like, nope, I'm fine, right? No, nope, oh, actually, I'm compromised. Well, it could say one thing, right? You know, I start, you know, if I'm looking for trades, right? That that could be enough of a signal that says I'm compromised and I need to do something and act. So no, it doesn't have to be, you know, that second example. It could be that first example for somebody that, you know, has some very clear points. I mean, I think the ones that are done done best are the ones that are the most consolidated. I don't want to see you know, uh, 50 characters, 50 word, or five, sorry, 500 words for each one of these line items, unless you can internalize that. Because in real time, man, things happen too fast. You need to know, you know, that you're at level two 
uh, you know, as quickly as you'd, as you'd see an opportunity in a fast moving market, right? You gotta be able to act fast. So that means you gotta kind of study it. And so it, it can be, you know, uh, very simple or, or complicated, but either way, you gotta know what it is uh, and, and, know, and know it quickly. Right. I want to remind everyone of the first, I think it was 2008 or something, when I first came on, the first time I tried to describe this process of kind of becoming compromised, I said it's it's like um, like a trader who's, who's, who's drunk. You know, you're drunk, you're not aware that you <laughs> shouldn't or can't drive. It seems like everything is fine. You just need to channel that anger or fear, whatever it is. But actually, you 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 blow up, you hit your lo daily loss limit, or blow up your account if you have no limits, and then you look back. You, you know, several hours later, a day or two later, you look back at the chart and you just smack yourself in the head and go, "How could I not see this?" And the goal here is to map that process so that you can catch it before it gets that deep, right? I mean, that's basically what we're shooting for. Yeah, and and the reality is that you you guys do this all the time for market data. I mean, this is where if you couldn't see patterns in the market, you're you're flying blind. I mean, you got nothing. So so this is not different. It's just you're not used to doing it for this stuff. So think about yourself as like the you know the TA guys back in 1970. Right, right, cool. So let's pivot for a second here. And talk about this uh, this ebook that you put out there. It's uh, it's called it's it's the Intuition ebook. Uh, those of you who are on GoToWebinar, uh, this PDF is actually made available to you by Jared. Uh, you just need to go into your uh, chat app that's on your screen and find the document. As you can see, the arrow shown there, and you can click on it and open it and download it. For those of you on um, YouTube live, and uh, for those of you who want to, just go to go to ct.pro forward slash tendler dash ebook, and that'll send you to Jared's website, and you can just uh, sign up to receive that um, to receive that ebook. I, I, th I think it's a very interesting uh, piece that he has put together, and it's it, this kind of stuff is. You know, we can practice all the technical analysis that we want, but if the machine that's going to execute is not up to speed, it's all for naught. And I know it's much easier to toy with a new indicator than it is to change our or to learn about ourselves and to change our behavior. But this is uh, your look, I, I've been doing this for 21 years. I can safely say that you're just not going to make it because sooner it's like a ticking time bomb. Sooner or later, you're you're going to have that day where you're tired. Discipline is like a muscle; it gets fatigued, and you're not going to be able to see where you're compromised. You don't know where you are in those steps that Jared had described, and you end up basically getting that phone call saying you need to send in some money, you know, which is the worst mm -hmm. thing that can happen. Um, so grab the, what, what would you like to tell us um, about the Intuition ebook uh, for traders to kind of maximize its use or what they can extract out of it? Yeah, I mean, basically it's a companion to the mental game of trading. Um, it was a topic that I like, I, I, it just kept coming up chapter after chapter, but there wasn't like a good clean place for it. So I decided to kind of blow it out and make it a little bit bigger and, and but for me, you know, intuition is one of these things that is, I, I think, kind of often talked about in a more esoteric way. And so we can look at it more pragmatically. We can look at it more practically. And for a lot of you, you don't trust your intuition because you don't have enough competency around it. You don't know how to differentiate the instances when your intuition is more likely to be right and versus when it's more likely to be wrong. And when it's more likely to be wrong, it's because your emotions are kind of masquerading as intuition and and you're you're being compelled to take trades that you think are creative and, you know, showing how smart you are. And it turns out like it's actually kind of, you know, anger or greed is, has compromised you. So, so being able to kind of create that, 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 uh, the differential between those two points is really key. And then kind of beyond that, we actually can con conceptualize that there's research that talks about with the origin of, of intuition. And I talk about it in the, in, in the ebook, it's not complicated, but I think it will give you a different perspective on this thing 
And I think at the end of the day, we want to be able to kind of trust these big opportunities, these big moves that we we sort of see on the horizon. And if you're a savvy enough trader, you know, to be able to kind of like capitalize on that, that that's really important. But I also do make it very clear in, in the book that, that this is really not for, you know, new traders. You have to have a bedrock of knowledge by which your intuition is leveraging. If you don't have that, yeah, you could find some intuition and, you know, some some opportunities in the tech sector because you happen to use a, an app or a tool or whatever. But that's not real intuition as a trader. That's just using your sense of the market as a whole, uh, you know, the, the 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 commercial market, not the trading market. So, you know, you need to be able, you, you need to have the skill in order to leverage it. Um, and then, you know, there's probably I think four or five pages on like like how to actually be able to access and and tap into your intuition you know more often again in a very kind of pragmatic practical way at the end of the day the process just so just as a review and i know convergent trading traders hear this a lot the the process is we don't know what we're doing and we don't know that we don't know what we're doing the second stage is we realize we don't know what we're doing that's the second stage of competence stage three is the calculated focused disciplined um practice and documentation and this is where the 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 mapping and things like that go on and what happens is through the virtue of repetition and experience it becomes it moves from a logical process to more of a subconscious process uh and then that enhanced by intuition is really how some traders don't see a losing day in like six months you know and it's just like is that even possible it's just you know how is it that kobe bryant can be getting smacked in the face let go of the ball and still sink a three-pointer without even seeing you think he, he doesn't even know where the basket is and yet he gets it in you know so that's the sort of thing that intuition kind of ultimately uh, does um we're going to start the q a right after the q a we'll go into the details of how this book giveaway takes place we're be, in the interest of time we're going to try to keep these questions to about i know it's tough but maybe two to three minutes tops uh we ordered the questions in in the order of uh, what we thought was most impactful for the group or useful for the group the first question comes from John. I'm part of a small trading accountability group. Most of us have read your book or are familiar with, with your work. Any tips for how to take advantage of a group setting while implementing your approach? I.e., how can we how can we can help each other reach goals like reducing our C game, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, first off, I love the fact that this is happening. Um, you know, again, I said earlier, uh, being able to kind of get feedback from other people can be an important part of the stage so how to do that um, a number of things i think if you can kind of share each other's a to c game analysis it's a, it's a tool that i also talk about it's another version of these maps um, share them with each other right and 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 make it the kind of thing that you're all kind of aware of what your your c games are it, it, it'll help you to recognize when somebody is making excuses and kind of using some bs to maybe uh, work around some of the mistakes that they've made um, versus being really honest when, you know, those problems occur because there needs to be continual kind of growth and understanding. And if if sometimes it can be easy for us refle reflexively to kind of shut down our own, you know, kind of internal analysis. So I think having everybody kind of have maybe like a Google Doc shared document where everybody can see it and can access it um, can be really helpful. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, what are some of the sticking point the sticking points right we're using a, another tool um, to kind of break down and understand the roots of your problems uh, maybe you go go through and 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 kind of review those uh, with each other almost kind of a, a little bit of a round table and you know maybe use the book as a resource to kind of help each other kind of figure out you know your way through it um, just to get different perspectives I mean at the end of the day though you know you as the individual within that group still need to be able to be really honest with yourself about what is right and what is wrong. Like as a coach, I can know very quickly whether somebody is telling me what they, what I think they want me to hear versus what's really kind of authentically true for them. And, and you know, very often there's like a strong reflex that tells you what you think. Um, and, and that oftentimes is right. And if you start to kind of talk around it, you know, you might end up kind of going down a path that you don't want to. So 
Got it. So uh, the second question we have is, how can I stop hesitating to take trades? This is a, such a big problem for traders. How can I stop hesitating to take trades that's set up according to my plan? How do I get rid of uh, the fear of losses being wrong? How do I gain confidence to hold, hold to trades, to targets? How do I work on improving my patience while trading? I mean, we lump these together and I can, I'm pretty sure that each of these deserves a one hour webcast on their own. But as a kind of a, let's just say you've just talked about this for the last two hours and you want to summarize what you just said, what would that answer be? Yeah, I actually, and the reason I kind of lump these together is because I actually think there's some fundamental flaws in the way that these questions are even asked. Um, they're far too simple. Um, you know, how can I stop hesitating? How can I get rid of fear? How can I gain confidence? Like you're making very complicated things very simple as if, you know, you have back pain. It's like, all right, how do I cure my back pain? How, what, what's causing it, right? So, so I think that's the more important question to be asking right now is why am I hesitating to take these trades? Why am I fearing losses and fearing being wrong? Why am I unable to have confidence to hold to my target? That's the question that you need to be asking. And, and that was, I think, the, the reason I kind of lumped these together. So, you know, my book talks about like answers those questions. Uh, you know, directly, uh, but you got to be asking the right question. I'm saying that for for not just the people that ask this, but for for all of you as well. Sometimes the biggest problem is a faulty perception on the problem itself, and and you know you cannot stop a problem you don't understand. You can't stop something you can't see, and you can't correct something that you don't understand. So that's the really the first thing that I would uh, encourage you know all of these uh, people to do is to, is to first better understand why these things are even occurring. I think during one of our discussions uh, over the last uh, few weeks, um, I think you you asked the question which is uh, often overlooked: um, Are we asking the right question? You know, I, what what are we what are we troubleshooting for here? Uh, the next question: What aspects of tilt can be used to produce positive outcomes? <laughs> I love this one. Do you think trading automation is the answer to consistent outcomes? What role does the mental game play in a trader who uses automated systems? I mean, I think if, if destruction is, your, is a positive outcome for you, then tilt is your, your, uh, your, your guy. No, I mean, I, I, tilt is, is basically anger leading to really poor decision making. So how is that productive? Well, sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we're sufficiently motivated. Um, you know, so I think to me, that's like the only productive thing, right? We want to use, I was actually talking with a golfer yesterday, he's playing in a Corn Ferry Tour event this week, right? And so frustration for him was this thing that was kind of just hanging over him. And and we found that it was no longer productive because he had learned all the lessons. It was like, all right, well, no, I don't need the frustration. I don't need to be frustrated anymore. I don't need to be pissed at myself for mistakes I've made. So what the heck, it's got to serve some productive value. Anger very often is destructive until you learn the lessons. So once that happens, then let the anger go. It's not It's not gonna serve you anymore. Um, as far as like the second part of this and the, the, the trading automation, you know, I'm not gonna uh, profess, you know, uh, an understanding of all of the latest systems that are out there. But, you know, the traders that I talk to, including some of the institutional ones, you know, they still believe that the, the, the biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, ways to make money is is not to rely on automation, right? That automation can make you money for sure, um, but you're going to make a lot more money from uh, manual trading. So yes, there can be a role in the short term in my mind for automated systems. You can certainly utilize them to help guide your decision making. I'm not going to uh, say that that you, you shouldn't do that either. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, if automation is suppressing emotions that need to be resolved, you are consuming bandwidth. Right, and and you're protect and you're preventing yourself from from evolving uh, as a trader. So, yeah, if you have got a broken ankle, you've got you know sprained ankle. Crutches are necessary, right? Automation can be that uh, for some of you, uh, but you know ultimately you don't want to be using them uh, permanently. It's like someone who says, of course you should yell yell as loud as you can when you're angry. Uh, it it gets answers and. It, really doesn't it might feel like it does it might feel like the person is complying but as soon as you look the other way they're going to do what they're going to do anyway so it's kind of like that thing where it sounds like you're offloading when you're on tilt but really it has no useful purpose in trading 
in, in my own experience, what are some effective methods for dealing with loss aversion? Feel of pulling the trigger. How common is this among traders? So first off, we got to get a good definition of what this question is really even asking, right? Loss aversion, right? Aversion to loss. Well, okay. So we're going to say that's like a fear of losing is that is here, but you know, you could have a fear of pulling the trigger because you fear mistakes also, fear of failure as a bigger thing. Um, it could be a, 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 a decent chunk of FOMO. It, you, you know, some traders actually, you know, uh, fear missing out and, and they <laughs> they know they're in a bad spot. They're aware that they sh they have this tension and they so they're not uh, pulling the trigger for that reason either. And then there are other traders who have this fear of pulling the trigger because they're not competent enough as a trader or they're not competent enough with the strategy or system. And there are unanswered questions that need to get answered. So it's not even a mental problem. You know, it's it's more of a technical, strategic one. Uh, but so let's assume that one of those you know fears are are the cause here. Uh, when this problem gets really big, we have to identify again. I mentioned the early signs, but a lot of what's occurring is like this anticipation of pain, right? If you knew absolute certainty, trading fairy lands on your shoulder says, Morad, nothing bad is going to happen by you executing this trade the worst thing that's going to happen is it's going to scratch is there any hesitation do you would you have any hesitation heck no right so a lot of times there's the anticipation of pain or uncertainty uh and and those things become what really builds this this like significant paralysis around your decision making so you've got to have some corrections that are kind of loaded up in before you know, those opportunities arise because when they arise, man, the fear is going to spike and you're not going to really have a chance. So, you know, as we get kind of deeper into the strategy, into the book, you learn of a tool called injecting logic. You need to be injecting logic like regularly within your trading day, kind of decreasing your overall amount of fear so that when the moment comes, right, you're not kind of already anticipating, you know, pain. Because frankly, I mean, that that stress can be there just because you're there, right? I mean, it's, you know, you sit down to trade, all of a sudden your emotions are jacked to level five on that scale just because you sat down, right? That's a problem in its own right. And so you need to be working through them on a regular basis, even if not, you're not even actively in a trade. How much of this is caused by lack of acceptance? Because that's how I've attacked this for myself and for prop traders and others is the fact that it's at the end of the day, it's random. Um, you know, the outcome is going to be random for this trade. I mean, the edge is not random because it's based on a, and a, on historical probability, but whether it's a win or a loss on this very next trade is unknowable. And I find that people will only act when they believe or feel, I think falsely, that there's no way this isn't going to work. And then once they do, now they're defending that position by expanding their stop, eliminating their stop, and kind of adding to the position because, hey, they must be right. Um, you know, how much of this is just just the the, the need to be right? Uh, it's definitely some of it. Um, there are others, right? So it's the need to be right, I think, is one, but the acceptance of the randomness is another. Um, but sometimes the acceptance of the randomness doesn't kind of happen because deep down, you know, there's this illusion of control. You want to have more control of your outcome. Um, and, and, and so kind of correcting that illusion is, is the key. Sometimes it's expectations of perfection. Um, you know, to you, a loss feels like you're failing, right? It feels like you're underperforming relative to, to what you expect of yourself. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily, uh, the loss, it's the it's what the loss represents. It means that you're failing on your goals. So, you know, there's this hesitation because if this one goes against you, it means you're kind of taking steps backwards towards the end goals that you want. You're kind of putting too much on this one trade and not, is on the line. So, you know, I think those are a handful of others, but there's many more in the book <laughs> as far as what it could be. But I think at the end of the day, you got to figure out what it is, right? And that's that's the thesis here is you got to understand why the hesitation is there. If you don't understand why, uh, your ability to correct it gets it gets significantly minimized. So uh, we'll finish on an action-based question here. Uh, how 
do I warm up to get in the zone, the right mindset in the morning before I start? Uh, and I'm kind of puzzled a little bit by the second part of this, uh, <laughs> this question. Does it help to have like high levels of testosterone to get in the zone and stay there longer? I'm not uh, sure. I mean, maybe they believe that testosterone is aggression and aggression is good. I'm not sure. But let's let's address the first portion. How to warm up to get in the zone in the morning. Yeah, so I agree with you. I have no idea on the second part of it. Um, I probably would say that there's not causal connection. Um, so getting in the zone requires two main things. You need to have the right amount of energy and you need a mind that is clear, right? So clarity doesn't mean empty. It doesn't mean like you're brainless. It means that your 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 system is very well internalized. There's not a lot of noise in your mind. You can have ideas about what you're looking for based on the type of day that it is, earning season, you know, expirations, whatever. Right? You have ideas of kind of how you're tactically going to go into this, much like an athlete would, right? There's sort of a, a pregame um, uh, guide, but there's not like a ton of data, right? I mean, I think one of the the mistakes that that traders make is they kind of fill their mind with too much stuff early on. So I think you've got to figure out what is the right amount of information that's going to help your mind be ready and clear. The energy part is the, is the, is the more important one though, right? You, you need to figure out what the right kind of level of energy, you know, you reliably get in the zone uh, with, right? For some of you, that means being very calm, very kind of Zen-like uh, meditative almost. So maybe for you actually doing meditation is a good thing. And, you know, spending some time, you know, in contemplation and thought and just, uh, you know, uh, not with a lot of noise around you. That's what you need. For others, it's the exact opposite, man. They're ready to go. Maybe their testosterone is cranked, but at least their adrenaline's high. They're, they're moving fast. They've got four cups of coffee, a little bit of Red Bull chaser, and, you know, off we go, right? And that's what they need. Others, and I would say I'm in this category, are kind of in the middle, uh, what I would call more of like an energized, right? Like, you know, we can look at this as kind of like an upside down you, right? Your performance sucks when your energy is really flat, right? Somebody sticks a computer in front of your face after you've been on the beach for a week. You know, you're not really even able to be quite kind of, kind of sharp. Conversely, if your energy is too intense and that happens when, you know, maybe you're too excited or there's too much emotion at play, you're too amped up, you're, 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 you're going to kind of equally suck. It's right at the top where the higher brain functions are most activated, right? And they're actually able to be utilized. If your energy is too low, there's not enough power there. If there's energy, if there's too much energy there, then they kind of short circuit, much like the emotional system can do to you. So you're trying to figure out what is that right condition. So, you know, based on what you find, you got to construct a pre-session routine that helps you to get into that energy state. Maybe it's doing some workout, maybe it's light exercise, maybe it's not a heavy one, maybe it's actually doing some uh, some weightlifting. Um, you know, maybe it's going for a walk outside and, you know, sitting in nature for a little bit. Or if you're in the city, finding a spot that you can find, you know, some kind of peace and relaxation with. Um, you know, again, figure out for you what's going to get you in that right, uh, you know, energy state and then figure out the right amount of data that's going to keep your mind clear. The biggest problem is the kind of the hangover from days before. Right. You know, you do a lot of work, uh, you know, and, and or there's trades kind of still on your mind. There's stuff still on your mind or there's personal stuff. Right. For some of you, you need to actually have a process for kind of shutting down your life, putting kind of like a, a, a mental like kind of line in the sand that says not now, not until the trading day is over. Am I even going to consider this stuff? You know, because that will help to keep that that clarity there. Look, I know a lot of you are on on social media for for trading reasons, but it can very easily kind of diverge into, you know, something that's unproductive, or you know, you're getting text messages from, you know, or you're involved in a trading chat group. Like, you got to make sure that you're really managing your data flow. So not that's not just a question of getting in the zone, but also kind of how you're going to stay there. It's also important to protect it. Uh, those of you who have been following a long time know I'm a huge advocate for meditation as a way of just kind of uh, being centered, not responding to the noise, being very clear about what inputs matter to you. Uh, we're coming up on the end of our time. Uh, the book giveaway. So we're gonna give away three of Jared's books uh, thanks to him for, for uh, making those available. The uh, winners will be selected. The three winners will be selected from the GoToWebinar registered attendee list. So we're going to go look at who attended on GoToWebinar, and we will randomly 
uh, and really truly randomly, we're not going to play favorites, uh, select those members, uh, those, those attendees uh, to whom we're going to send the book. You need to give us some time to get this done. You're going to get an email from us to confirm or to request your address and things like that. Uh, within seven, uh, uh, within uh, a few days of today, but you'll have seven days to respond. In order to make sure that email does not land in your uh, spam or junk folder, please add info at convergenttrading.com to your address list on Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, whatever you want you use. Make sure that that's whitelisted so you can see the email. Just a caveat: due to limitations on shipping. Some jurisdictions are going to be inaccessible. You know, we're not going to be able to send the book to North Korea or Syria. Or so, don't be offended if we're just not able, or through through the virtue of just expense, it may be get prohibitively costly to send you a book. So, uh, uh, so just understand that some jurisdictions are going to be off limits, uh, and depending on the carrier, it may take several weeks to a month to get the book over to you. So you'll hear from us about the book giveaway. We want to wrap things up by letting you know how you can get to get in touch with Jared. Again, you have the Intuition ebook from Jared. You also uh, can, can pick up a copy. If you don't want to wait for the giveaway, you can pick up a copy of uh, Jared's book um, and, and uh, or head over to his website at jaredtendler.com. Uh, Jared's also on Twitter if you want to have a, a, a conversation there, uh, twitter.com forward slash Jared Tendler. On LinkedIn, he's at linkedin.com forward slash n forward slash Jared Tendler. And of course, on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash Jared Tendler. Uh, so we'll leave you with that. We want to take a moment to say uh Thank you for everybody who has attended. I really hope you walked away with something that is actionable, even if it's that some it's something as simple as getting the audiobook or getting Jared's book or even going to the website. There's some free resources which I found very useful there. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, workbook type stuff and and do do that. Uh, your your brain is where it's at, so make sure it's in tip top shape. And Jared's kind of cut through the pardon the term, the crap to getting there. So, <laughs> so you know, this is not all uh, psychological kind of um, talk theory. This is more practical application um, and, and it, it should get your results. So thank you, Jared, for coming on. Thanks for taking the time to spend an hour with us. And uh, I know we didn't get to a lot of people. There are a lot of questions, Jared, that we did not get to. Yeah, uh, send, them, send them over though. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, maybe we, I'll uh, make another video or something, you know, to get those answered. Sounds good. Okay, we'll do that. Thanks yeah. everyone for being here, and we will send out the recording in the next day or two. Cheers, everybody, and have a great night. Take care.